All right, so we're going to do the, the cabbage dish. And I'm just going to show you um, kind of how we do it. So I think I take, I take a lot of pride in vegetable cookery. Um, working in California, in San Francisco, the produce there. Have you guys, a lot of you been in San Francisco? Yeah. Um, you know, the produce there is probably some of the best in the world. Um, so obviously the, the integrity of the vegetable is, you know, it's much different from, you know, a place in Hawaii where protein is everything, you know? So um, there's, a, there's a cabbage. This is a cabbage, essentially. So it's, it's much different looking than any other cabbage you've seen. Um, it's a Caraflex cabbage. It's a cone cabbage. So about five years ago, I worked at a restaurant in um, Lummi Island called Willow's Inn. And uh, they were growing this particular t type of cabbage. And I'd never seen it. Um, but when I tasted it, you know, I was blown away. Because this type of cabbage, it has zero sulfur. So, you know, when you cook cabbage, it has that smell. You know, it has that really strong smell, aroma. So this has zero of that. And it's basically all sugar. So essentially, the way we, we do this is, this is grown for us in Waimea. And the, basically, the, the climate in Waimea is much like, like San Francisco. It's very, it's sunny during the day, but it's very cool at night. So perfect weather for cabbage. Um, so what we do here is we just split the cabbage. And I cook this sous vide in a bag with just some butter and salt for probably about 20 minutes. So it, kind of just breaking down the core. And what we're going to do is, if we, if we were to serve this cabbage now, I mean, it would have, it would have good flavor, but you really want to draw out kind of like umami and everything. So you get a super hot pan with clarified. And we just char it. So I'm going to char this probably take probably about 20 minutes, really slow. And it's going to be almost blackened. But that, the, the caramelization, the blackening, it's not going to be bitter. It's just completely sweet. So you take a vegetable that you know, normally you like stew down or you steam, and you're adding layers of flavor, and you're adding caramelization, which you know, it just has a deeper flavor. Uh, so it eats, it eats much more like a protein than it does a vegetable. So we're going to just let that cook really slow. It's Caraflex, C-A-R-A-F-L-E-X. It's a cone cabbage, essentially. So this, I don't know anyone else growing this except them. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's delicious. Um, well, I'm born and raised in Hawaii. Um, you know, for I think my whole 20s, I didn't want to be in Hawaii. You know, I just wanted to be away. Because um, I felt, I felt like the food scene, I'd grown up cooking in like Roy's and Alan Wong's. And I felt like I, I wanted to see something else, you know? And, uh, you know, those 12 years away, um, you know, it, it, it showed me a lot. And it showed me, it also showed me an appreciation for what we have here. And I think, I think our food scene now, over the past five years, it's, I think it's becoming super relevant again in, in the national scene. Um, and there's a lot of young, I'm sure you guys have like Andrew Lay, right, uh, Gooch. There's a lot of young chefs now who are coming up who have also gone, gone away and are coming back to kind of just have, show, show people their style of, you know, like cooking in Hawaii. And, and I cooked, I trained in mostly French kitchens, but I'm Japanese. And I tend to not go through Japanese flavors, but I tend to have that palate. Um, but I think you, know, you guys are very lucky because you guys have great instructors. And you also have a really good food scene now. Um, and it's only getting better. So I mean, that was, that was the main reason why you know, I felt you know, it's a great place. It's a great to be a part of uh, the culture here and the scene. Because I mean, all the chefs are very supportive. It's not a very competitive you know, um, chef scene here. Everyone's very close. You know? um, so that, that's kind of why.
So he asked if, um, do I like open or closed kitchens better? No. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I've only worked in closed kitchens uh, before. Um, at Senia, we're completely exposed. Um, part of that is because our space is so small. So if we, if we close our, our, our space and close the kitchen, it would look even smaller, you know? So that's one reason why we did it. It also, I feel like people nowadays want to see people cooking and, and interact with, we, you know, we have a chef's counter. So we're always talking to our guests. And it's also great to see, you know, their feedback, you know, emotional feedback when they're eating your food, you know, good or bad, right? So I think there's positives for both, you know? Um, you definitely, you know, need to behave a lot more, you know, and just watch. I'm not saying we don't behave, but you need to watch, you know, what you do, obviously, in an open kitchen, right? So, which is how you should be working anyway, so. The weirdest? <laughs> Uh, I like to say I haven't created anything weird. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not I'm not a crazy adventurous with the dishes that I come up with. I'm very um, classically trained, but that's just the way I train. I mean, people have different inspirations. My inspiration is, you know, finding a reference point and trying to make that reference point as refined and delicious as possible. Yeah. Average day. So I get to the restaurant, I open it at about 7.45. And we have, we're open for lunch and dinner. Um, basically we go expedite lunch and we go through dinner and I left the restaurant last night at 12.45. So I mean, it's a pretty long day, yeah. I mean, I'm lucky I live like two minutes away from my restaurant, but um, you know, it's probably 16, 17 hours a day. I wouldn't say that's normal, but um, I think because, you know, I'm a chef owner, I don't really want to leave it, you know, um, and my partner was also off yesterday, so certain days that, you know, you need to put in like 16, 17 hours. Um, you know, you also are very protective over, you know, your baby, right? So you don't want to just let it go, I guess. So I'm very, you know, I would say my one fault is I'm very, uh, I'm very a micromanager. You know, I like to do things. I don't like to just delegate. I li I'd rather do it than have everyone do it. But, you know, I'm starting to kind of let go a bit and, you know, um, delegate. But, you know, when it's, when it's your restaurant and everything's on the line, you know, I'm very active. I, I, I cook every night. You know, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a chef who, um, these before, before service, um, I, I would say I, I'm a working chef. You know, I, wor I work, I could say I've been successful so far because I've put in so much hard work. And, you know, that, that's not really gonna stop. Um, you know, there's a lot of chefs nowadays who open restaurants and are never there. And there's a point in, in someone's career where I think that's okay, but I'm still coming up and I'm still young and this is my first restaurant. And I feel like I owe it to people who are coming into the restaurant for me to be there every time they're there, you know? Um, not that they want to see me, but I want to create an experience that they came into my restaurant. So average day is, is usually 8 o'clock, and, you know, depending on how busy it is, 11.30 to 12.45, yeah. I have. Um, so our restaurant is actually closed next week for, for one week. And we decided to do that um, for our staff. Uh, you know, it was a crazy year. Um, we decided to close one, one week in um, winter and one week during the summer. And that's purely for people. And we pay all our cooks for, for the time off. That's purely for, for people to relax and also get inspiration. So I'm going to Tokyo on next week. And I've probably been there now six times in like three years. And for me, that's my inspiration, inspirational place. And it's not because I cook Japanese food, but it's, you know, the ded dedication to the craft 
that the chefs in Tokyo display that really inspires me. So I think it's really important, you know, I mean, if financially you're able to, is to travel. You know, I think that's really what opened my eyes to a lot of things is getting out of Hawaii and seeing what's out there and then you can always come back, you know? I think Roy, obviously, um, you know, Chef Garnier, you know, he's a long time uh, Roy's guy and I, I've known him since I was a teenager. Um, <laughs> but uh, Roy, obviously, um, you know, that was a very formative time. It was probably when I was like 17, 18. Um, and then Thomas Keller, who I was able to work for, um, you know, in my opinion, he's the greatest chef of my generation. Um, and it was always a, a dream of mine to go to work for him in his, you know, the French Laundry and Per Se. Um, so those are the two chefs that really inspired me. And then my mentor, uh, his name is Ron Siegel. And Ron Siegel was the opening um, chef of the French Laundry with Thomas. So I kind of followed in that same family of chefs. And that's why my training, you know, kind of mirrors all those people. You know, it's, um, but you know, Roy, what, what, what's so great about Roy is he's very helpful. You know, he's very helpful for the younger generation. I mean, he got me my first job in San Francisco. So, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about people who give back, you know? And, you know, he's at a point where he's extremely successful with a lot of restaurants, but, you know, he's taking care of people. He's, have, he's had great people come through his restaurants, and now he's in a position where, you know, he's giving back with the Food and Wine Festival. Um, so I was definitely a beneficiary of, of his mentorship. To me, a new dish starts with an ingredient. So I, I'm not a type of person who thinks about the plating of a dish. I think about the ingredient and how to make it the best possible ingredient. So I'll, so I'll flip this real quick so you guys can see how caramelized the cabbage is. And that's, if you did this with a normal cabbage, um, it wouldn't get that dark, only because there's so much water in cabbage. This, this type of cabbage, it, uh, it just has so much sugar. So it's, I mean, you can see it, it looks really dark but that's just flavor, you know, it's all the umami. So that took, you know, about 10, 15 minutes, uh, really slow. I don't, I don't look at any resumes, honestly. The only thing I, I look at on a resume is how long they've spent at a place. I think, you know, when we opened Senia, um, we got a, a million resumes and from people all over the country, you know, working at, you know, amazing three-star Michelin places, but they worked there for six months, you know? Uh, and their, their resume was this long, and it was at all these amazing places. We hired all local kids, and we hired all kids who had never worked in a fine dining restaurant. We, you know, we hired two kids who worked at a breakfast place, but they worked there for three years, you know? So, number one we look for is the, the commitment to, to the craft, you know? Um, you're not gonna learn, you're gonna learn stuff in my restaurant in a year, but you'll learn, you'll be, you know, much more adept at everything in two years, you know? And if you stay three years, then you'll be, you'll be able to say you work at the whole kitchen, you know? So I think um, I've noticed in this generation that people are very impatient and don't wanna put in the time. And, you know, I'll take somebody over who's never worked in a kitchen and mold him, you know, for years over somebody who has worked in all these amazing kitchens and, you know, just wants to bounce around, you know, and that's, for, for a chef, that's like the worst thing is to have, you know, a new kitchen every six months, you know, it's difficult and it kind of throws off the rhythm of the kitchen. So, uh, attitude is number one and um, I think an understanding that this industry is very hard but it's also very rewarding. Not necessarily financially, but you know, if you look at the big picture, it's gonna pay off. You know, I mean, I worked, I worked for 12, 14 years, and nobody knew my name, nobody cared, you know, but I, I felt like I was getting better every year, and 
now I'm, I'm, I'm in a position where I can employ people, you know, and, and people want to work with us. Um, and, you know, awards and accolades, they come, you know, if you work hard. So number one is a commitment to your craft. I think, you know, nowadays people need to pay rent, you know, but to be honest with you, I mean, I was, I was broke for so long, you know, you, you eat out maybe once a month, but it's all about getting better. And, and usually the higher paying job you have is probably the worse the restaurant is, to be honest with you. I know that sounds weird, but you know, all these restaurants, um, all the great ones, everybody wants to work there, you know? So they don't necessarily pay you the, the highest wage, but they, they teach you, they give you in other ways, you know? I'm not saying that you guys should take that route, but I'm saying, you know, that's what route I took. And, you know, it, it is paying off because I have my own restaurant now, you know? Um, but, yeah, that's a good question. Minimum of two years. So I was in San Francisco for six years. I was at two restaurants for three years. And the first day I was there for a little less than two and a half years. So, you know, you stay at those restaurants a year now and you're really not even in their system anymore, you know? It's like, um, you have to put in the time to get respect. And uh, that's kind of the only way to do it. Uh, they're different. I mean, I love, I love the way people cook in San Francisco because of the ingredients. The ingredients are so amazing. Um, so there's a lot less um, manipulation. You know, everything, the ingredients kind of speak for themselves. And that's kind of, the cabbage is kind of a nod to, you know, cooking something, a single ingredient and making it better, you know? Um, I mean, I don't think anyone would imagine that cabbage would be our number one seller, but it's like by far, you know, every table gets it. Um, and I'm proud of that because it's not like foie gras, it's not wagyu, you know, it's a dish that, you know, it's very humble. It's very humble, but we take a lot of care um, into the preparation. So, you know, people love it. So um, the last thing I'm going to do is, um, do you guys see this? No? Where's the camera? You guys see it? Okay, so essentially this is from our tasting menu, and it's, it's, a, it's a foie gras terrine. So do it the same method we did it. Um, cure the foie gras, blend it, and then we set it in a mold. And um, also put a little bit of gelatin in it. So you can see it kind of looks like a honeycomb, right? So we place the foie gras, we set it in a, in a mold that we made, our honeycomb mold. Pipe it in and we freeze it, and then we punch it out. And then what we do is we glaze it. This is, um, do you have like an offset spatula? So essentially we, um, we glaze it with like burnt honey. So this is local honey that we caramelize, almost burn it, and then we just add water to stop it. So it's a burnt honey gelée. So I'll try to do this without a spatula, but it's very, very soft. It's, it's good, I got it, thank you. <laughs> so I know Haley wanted me to show you kind of like inspiration uh, behind plating. Um, so this dish is, is not on our tasting menu anymore, but it was on last week. So. The flavors of this dish is uh, obviously foie gras. Um, the gelée is honey. And then we have a bunch of um, kind of like fall fruit. So we have uh, poached cranberries. We have raw celery. And we have uh, a pickled Asian pear. So it's all, it's all flavors that are pretty uh, complimentary. So this, this is a, we juice cranberries and we steep it with ginger. And we do the same preparation as we do the honey vinegar, we mix it with agar, cook it, and we set it, and then we blend it. So it's really smooth. So with plating, I mean, you can kind of do whatever you want. 
So what I would do is probably just do a few dots of cranberry gel. Do the Asian pear. Can you guys see me plating this or no? Yeah, you can see it. A few pieces of the cranberry. And these are just celery, uh, raw celery, we call it ribbons. We just shave it with a, um, with a vegetable peeler. So we peel it and then we, 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 we take off the outer exterior and we peel it really thinly and we put it in ice water and then it curls. So it's just raw, raw celery. So obviously that adds kind of like a crunch. And then obviously we, uh, we take the same, um, this is bee pollen. Kind of has like a, kind of a sweet flavor. So we garnish it with bee pollen. And this bee pollen is from the vanilla honey. And then we just have some, uh, just some herbs. So there's sorrel, red ribbon sorrel, and violas, and a little bit of marigold. So the sorrel, I know a lot of people are putting flowers everywhere and all these garnishes. To me, it's important, but it needs to add something. So the sorrel, I don't know if you guys ever had sorrel, but it's really sour. So it adds a good, good acidity. And then very floral with the violas. And that's kind of it. That would be the dish. I mean, it's very simple in its technique. I just showed you how to do the mousse. Um, obviously, the technique is, you, need, you know, you need to have good technique. But, you know, if you had that technique, it's a, it's a very, very simple dish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, you want every component. You want someone to eat, a, eat something with every component, right? So. I put, you know, four cranberries because I feel like this, you can eat this in like four, four sectioned off bites, right? So I put four pieces of celery for the same reason. So there's no real rhyme or reason, but I try to think about if somewhere were to have the first bite and the last bite, I want it to be the same. And then, you know, why did I plate on the side of the bowl? I don't know. That's how I felt like it this time. But I'll tell you, you know, our, our, the only real dish that kind of stays the, the same is the cabbage plating. Um, which is right there. You know, we completely cover it with uh, kombu, parmesan dill, and then the green powder is moringa. I'm sure you guys know what uh, manungai or moringa powder. So this is local from Wainai, the powder. Uh, the green puree is a green goddess dressing, which is uh, tarragon, basil, chives, parsley, uh, mustard, and then the white dots are, is buttermilk. So you want somebody to cut open and kind of mix everything together. So this is, a, this is an, another version of the foie gras. So this is, so you can, you know, the technique I showed you, you can set it in any type of pan and, you know, create a gel and cut it. You can cut it in circles or you can cut it in, um, you know, little rectangles. So this, this is glazed with like a dashi. And then there's unagi relish, pickled daikon, and celery ribbons. And we serve it with seaweed brioche. So that's, that's another version. That's on our menu right now. And then the next one. So this is kind of fun. Um, there's a purveyor um, in California that wanted to collaborate on a caviar, a special caviar. So we basically sent them uh, smoked kawaii sea salt. And there's a few restaurants like Cezanne, Komi, that have a specialty caviar. So this is our specialty caviar. And we do this on occasion um, by the ounce. We sell it by the ounce. So we have creme fraiche, we have whipped, whipped maple syrup. Those uh, up top are um, wagyu fat biscuits. And then on the, right, on the left of that is those things that look like logs. They're actually potatoes that we, it's a lot of work. We steam it and then we punch it and then we refry it. But, you know, and then the pot in front of that is we, we smoke hamachi collars and make a riette. So it's kind of like, 
it's a really fun caviar presentation because uh, you can get sweet or you can get savory. And that's a dish that you guys just saw. Um, so this one was with strawberry guava and macadamia nut butter. So it's obviously very you know, versatile with the flavors. Uh, we, we try to keep very seasonal. Um, you know, th there's not a lot of restaurants in Hawaii that keep seasonal because there's not really any seasons here. But, you know, me and my partner both trained in very seasonal places. My partner's from London or from England. So obviously there's very seasonal and we also met in New York. So, you know, this is strawberry guava that actually he, he hiked for. And then this is a more like fall winter version of our dish. I think the, the best advice um, actually Roy gave me was, you know, always try to work at the best restaurants. And whenever you leave one restaurant, make sure the restaurant they work at next is even better. So never go down, just keep on, you know, going up. And I feel like a good advice I give my cooks is like, once you become comfortable at a restaurant, it's time to go. You know, um, I don't think any of my cooks are comfortable. <laughs> yet because there's so much work, but um, once they get to that point, I mean, I have a sous chef who's actually a graduate of KCC, and um, he was with me at my last job, and he came with me to San Francisco, and, you know, the kid is just, he's going to be, he's going to be a star, and he's, he's 25 years old, but he's probably been with me for three years now, and after this year, he's going to, he's got to go to New York. I, we're kicking him out, you know, so time for him to go see something else. And I feel like if you're with somebody for too long, also, you know, you kind of cap out at what you learn, you know? And you need to see different styles. So I'm not, I'm not a believer in having a person work for me for like 10 years. I'd rather someone work for me for like three or four and then move on. And if they want to come back, then they can come back. But I, I, I feel like you need to work for different people, you know, and not just, stay in one spot because I think the restaurant, you know, doesn't really benefit from somebody who's just been there the whole time. You know, I, I think there's, it needs, it always needs fresh blood. That's what I feel. Open up a restaurant. Um, obviously, train with great people. Uh, Put yourself in a good position to learn a lot. Um, be humble. And you have to know that it's, it's going to be more work than you ever imagined to open a restaurant, whether it's fine dining or casual. You know, the, the pride to open a restaurant, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. And it, you're not going to get paid a lot. You're not going to make a lot of money. But as long as you know that, you know, it's worth it. It took us almost two years to get it to get it finished, and a lot of that was because we're in Chinatown and we're in a historic building. Um, obviously, a lot things take a lot longer in Hawaii, just permitting and planning. Um, but ours ours was a was a space that was never a restaurant, so we had to do everything. You know, so that's also going to be the reason why it takes it takes a longer time. But um, it normally doesn't take that long. <laughs> So Senia, um, so my partner came up with it, and it's uh, usually spelled with an X, Senia, and it's Greek for hospitality. And if you look at um, our logo, our logo is essentially an MRI of a pineapple. So obviously the pineapple is a, the, the universal sign of hospitality. So you know, we want to feel like people are taken care of when they come. Yeah, we can heat it up now. Okay. And then, All right. So. Oh, let's get a shot of bacon. Just warm it. Yeah, just warm it. That's it. He's going to give you a sample of, of what he created with the mousse, the chicken liver mousse, so you'll have an opportunity to taste it. Really appreciate you do, giving Absolutely. your time because obviously with the new restaurant, I really twisted his arm hard to get him to come today because he's very busy working really long hours and he gave up what limited time off he had to come and do this program for all of you. So 
very grateful, Chef, Absolutely. for doing that. Yeah, I see you.